Why don't you turn with me to John chapter 20 today? Uh, we're going to get into God's word and just kind of read through some of the story and, um, and just kind of hear this good news today. And, you know, it makes me wonder uh, with the big family of God sitting together, how the early church might have done it, gathering in a courtyard, gathering um, in a temple, gathering, you know, um, just together on a, on an Easter Sunday, on a first uh, day of the week with the body of Christ, with the family of God, um, kids, older people, and everybody in the middle just gathering together to hear the story of Jesus. And that's really why we're here. And so for some of you, you maybe hear this all the time. You, you know the story about Jesus. I'm not about to tell you anything new. I'm not about to spoil it for you, but I will go ahead and spoil it for you and tell you that he's not on a cross anymore, that he rose from the grave. Um, and so you're like, oh my gosh, he, he's not dead anymore? Yeah, uh, spoiler alert, he's alive. And so uh, that's why we keep gathering today and we don't go and lay you know, flowers at a graveside in you know, Jerusalem, but that we gather to celebrate that he did rise. But in the Southeast, I mean, I would have to assume that many of us, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is the millionth time you've heard that. <laughs> And so how does it come alive to you? Like, how, 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 why is it that you see like some believers and some Christians like shouting for joy and clapping their hands and dancing and shaking, you know, uh, the little shakers around? You're like, okay, yeah, we get it. He rose this morning. If I can, I want to read you the same story and just give you some simple truths about that story that I hope uh, will just ignite in your heart and your mind something about the way God feels about you. And so in John chapter 20, for those that weren't here with us for Good Friday service, we kind of look through the scriptures uh, instead of looking through Matthew, which we typically do. Matthew gives a pretty good detail of, of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. There's three other what we would call gospels or, or, or books that were written about Jesus's earthly ministry. And the Gospel of John is one of those, but John's perspective is a little bit different than Matthew or Mark or Luke in that it focuses on his deity. That Jesus wasn't just a good man, that, that you know, he wasn't just a Jew, but that he literally is king, that, that he is Lord. And so we saw him on Good Friday as king, even though he was still king. He was ruling and reigning when he laid down his life. The Bible says no man ever takes his life, but he lays it down for us. But even today, we still kind of view him as king. And so as we, as we read the scriptures this morning, I want you to think of Jesus being like a king. Um, I, I know we're not ruled by a king in our country, but you can imagine a lot of people are fascinated with what happens in, in, in England and, and with the king and queen there. And so, um, so, so just try and imagine, if you can, a, a king perspective of Jesus in this moment as we read through the text. So in John chapter 20, there's Bibles in the seats in front of you if you want to take it. I'm not sure what page it's on, but it's in there somewhere. You can look at the index and find the number to cheat. But John chapter 20, the 20 is the big verse, or big numbers. Uh, verse one is the little numbers. It says this. Now on the first day of the week, that would be a Sunday, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and she saw that the stone, which there was a stone in front of this place where Jesus was buried, the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. So she ran out and she went to Simon Peter. You see, her perspective was not like, you know, Jesus is risen from the grave. Like you and I were gathering today on a Sunday. We're like, he's alive, right? Like that was not her perspective. Her perspective was a little bit different. She actually runs and is upset. And so she says, and she finds one of Jesus's apostles, one of his disciples named Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved talking about John. He said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they laid him. Drop down to verse 11. So Mary's there standing at the tomb thinking that somebody has robbed this tomb. Some grave robber has taken the literal body of Jesus. And they're like, where is Jesus at? Even though it was guarded by Roman soldiers. Verse 11 says, but Mary stood there weeping outside of the tomb. And she wept and she stooped to look into the tomb. And, but then she saw something pretty unique here. She says she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been laid and one the head and, and one there at the feet. And the woman, or, or, and they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, well, they have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and then she saw Jesus standing there. And she was like, what, what, what's going on? But she did not know that it was Jesus. Who's this guy walking in here? Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
Supposing him to be a gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, if you've taken my Jesus away, if you've taken my son away, like tell me where you have laid him. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned, said to him in Aramaic, rabbi, pretty much. She calls him a teacher, which is one of the phrases, one of the titles that's used a lot throughout the gospels of what Jesus is called. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Now, Something's about to, to happen here when Mary goes back, who's like one of the first evangelists that we have in the scriptures, right? Is this woman that gets this news. She sees Jesus is risen. Jesus gives her instructions and says, hey, I want you to go start telling people that I'm alive. And so she goes and runs back to the disciples. And, and then we get this storyline of, of Jesus coming and fellowshipping with his disciples. He's going to spend several days with them before he ascends into heaven. Uh, many of you, you may be familiar with the story. If you're not, Jesus is about to, to do something pretty incredible here with his followers. Something that for some reason they had not understood uh, the entire time of his earthly ministry. Jesus had been talking about a kingdom to be established, that he would be their king. He had been talking about how he was going to empower them. And sometimes they would get it, but then other times they would not get it. Jesus would say things like, hey, I'm going to die. And, and Jesus' closest apostle tes, says to him, not so, Lord. Like, they didn't understand it. Well, the scriptures actually teach us why they didn't get it, because the Bible says if they did truly understand all of Jesus's plans, they would have never crucified Jesus. So Jesus is doing something very intentional here because he loves us, because he cares for us. But, but what is he trying to do? What is, what is Jesus's end goal? So if you keep reading in verse 19, it says this. On the evening of that day, that first day of the week on Sunday... The doors being locked where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, this is going to be a promise of actually what he talks about in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. He breathed on them and he says, and they received the Holy Spirit. He says, if you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, I want you to keep this in mind of what Jesus is doing. He's risen from the grave and then he's about to give them as their king some marching orders. And the marching orders are this. I'm going to send you out with power. What is that power? Is it ammo power? Is it money power? Is it political power? No. He says, I'm going to send you out with power. The power that he's giving them is what he already told them that he was going to give them. It is the power. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so he says he breathed the Holy Spirit on them. In other words, th th there was this, there was this exchange of Jesus saying something and then them receiving it in faith, them taking it, taking a good gift from what God had given them. So we see this story in, in, in John chapter 20 and 21, but I want us to correlate, if we can, to what Matthew 28 says. Because Matthew 28 is what some would call the, the Great Commission. So why don't you turn just a couple of books back, Matthew 28, and look down at verse 16, and look at how Matthew kind of puts some of this story. Jesus is talking with his disciples. Matthew 28, verse 16 says this, Now the eleven disciples, they went to Galilee, to the mountain that Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded to you. And behold, I'm with you till the ends of the age. So Jesus rises from the grave. He says, all authority has been given to me. He's a king. He was like, but here's what I want to do as a king. I want to empower you to go do a work, right? And this is typically how most people view Christianity, right? Is that they see Jesus is, man, Jesus is all powerful and he's amazing and he's conquered the grave as a Christian. That's pretty cool. Like we're coming here to celebrate. And then it's like, okay. And then I find out that Jesus wants to use me. And that I can go evangelize and I can go make disciples and I can go tell people about Jesus. And that's pretty cool, right? But the question is, is why is it that so many Christians don't participate 
in the king's orders? Why is it that usually, typically, it's the people that have some type of seminary theological training. It's, it's somebody that's been ordained. Like if, if you were to, to talk to most Christians, especially in the American church, and you were to ask them, hey, are, are you a missionary? They would say, no, 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 that's somebody that's over in China. That's somebody that's over in Africa. That's somebody in a third world country ministering to people, sharing the gospel. I'm not called to do that. But, but we've missed the marching orders of Jesus that, where he's calling all of his disciples to go and to make disciples. If you're not making disciples as a Christian, then you're just doing a Bible study. Can I just be honest with you? What do you mean by that? You're just retaining a bunch of information, but not doing anything with it. We are called to actually participate in the same thing that Jesus is doing. So then what is the disconnect? Because some of you, you, you feel frustrated with that. You've been following Jesus for years, but it's still very hard to talk about your faith. It's still very hard to go out and what we would call evangelize and tell others about your faith and what Jesus has done and to pray for people. You're like, yeah, I don't know if I can pray for you, but let me call my pastor. He'll pray for you. I don't know if I can pray for you, but, but you know, where's Miss Pam? Like, I'll, I'll get Miss Pam to pray for you. She's a prayer warrior, right? Like, like I'll, I'll ask somebody else that seems like, like they would be good at praying, and I'll get them to participate in the good king's work that he's called us to do. But, but I'm not qualified to do that. There's a disconnect. And I think the disconnect is, is that sometimes we stop reading the story, and we actually, we can look into the next chapter and see maybe what that disconnect is. Look at John 21. We see that, that they were called to be sent in John 20 and Matthew 28, but go back to, to John 21 and look at this discord between the apostle Peter and Jesus. John 21 says this in verse 15. He says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, I know that you know that I love you. If you look in the Greek language, there's, there's actually two different words there. We have an English Bible, but the, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. And so our language can be a little generic when we use the term like love. But, but there are different Greek words that actually define this word that we would use as word, love. And so what Jesus is actually saying here in Greek is he's saying, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter's response is, I phileo you. So Jesus is saying like, hey, do, do, you, do you love me? like in a supernatural spiritual way, like in an unconditional way. And Peter's response is, I phileo you. You're, you're my friend. You're, you're my pal. But I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how deep it's going to be other than that. So Jesus has this discord with him and he says, do you love me? And he says, yeah, I, I love you. And so he says, well, feed my lambs. That's not literal lambs. He's talking about the people. The people that Peter is sending him to are the people that Jesus is sending Peter to. He's telling the apostle Peter, he's saying, hey, if you love me, th then go minister to my people. And so he asked him again a second time and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, well, then tend to my sheep. Talking about the, the, the people of God. Verse 17 says, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you, you know everything. You, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, feed my sheep. What's interesting about these two chapters, we have one chapter that's giving a command, so, some would call a commission for believers. But in the next chapter, in chapter 21, we see there's a questioning of love. And, and, and here's the distinction sometimes about the work of the Lord that we cannot miss as the people of God, is that our work is an overflow of the love of Christ. Uh, I've been reading this book called um, Invitation to uh, a, journey, a Journey to Discipleship. Invitation. Oh, A Journey to, what is it called? Say the, say the name of it. I've never read the cover before, but I'm reading the inside of it. <laughs> I just read the Bible. Um, no, I've been reading this book, and, and there's, some, there's some beautiful things that, in there that are, that are being said. Um, that have really just kind of piqued my interest. And, and for those that don't know, Pastor Harrison has been leading our discipleship groups here at our church and, and, and just really honing in on what discipleship is going to look like moving forward in our church. And, um, and it's really been changing those that have been a part of that leadership group, preparing to expand it out to our church. It's really been changing our lives. And, and, um, and it's brought up a, a, a lot of questions. And, and one of the things that, that, that this book 
that brings up is this idea, this concept of, of we as Christians, we're, we're called to, to be something before we can ever do something. And so as I was reading through these chapters, it was like the Holy Spirit just like slapped me upside the head and said, Jared, this is, this is, this is why so many Christians struggle with the doing part. This is why so many Christians struggle with fulfilling the Great Commission. This is why so many Christians struggle with a prayer life, with a study life, with, with spiritual, what we would call spiritual disciplines, is, is it's not coming from the right place. Because in John chapter 20, he's saying, hey, I want to send you. But in John chapter 21, he's telling the apostle Peter, do you love me? Because based on how we feel about Jesus will be the evidence of what we do for Jesus, not the other way around. See, sometimes in the American church culture, one of the things we want to do is, is to be a performer, to be a striver, to be one that looks like we've got our lives together, to be one that looks like that we're trying to, to help our marriage, you know, like our marriage, oh man, like you can usually tell who's got a struggling marriage by how long the Facebook post is. Everybody felt uncomfortable. Because it's like we're trying to strive to like, look at my life and look that I'm holding everything together. And look, look, like my kids, they're beautiful and, and they're going to be MLB stars one day. And so we're going to travel the state of Georgia and let them hit off T-balls and, and it's going to be amazing. But then internally, like we're burned out, we're tired. We don't have time for prayer. We don't have time for study. We don't have time to worship God. We don't have time to be evangelists because we're just trying to hold our lives together. We're just trying to do and this is backwards. This is backwards. This is not what Jesus is inviting us into. Some Christians think that all they need in their Christian faith, and you may even show up here today on an Easter Sunday and you think, you know, things are hard for me and so I just need to get saved. I just, I need help. I just, you know, maybe Jesus can help me. And, and I've led a lot of Easter services before where we would have like what we would call an invitation, a time to respond. And there's going to be an invitation here. But um, have you ever heard a pastor say, now with every head bowed and every eye closed? And let me tell you what a typical invitation would look like in most churches in America is that a pastor stands up on stage, he shares with you about what Jesus has done for you, and he talks about morality, and, and you probably want to be a good person, right? Well, you can't, but Jesus can help you. And so Jesus is going to help you start being a better husband. Jesus is going to help you start being a better young person. Jesus is going to help you start being a better worker. He's going to help you be all these things. And you're like, I want to be a better husband. I, I, I want to be a better man. I want to be a better woman. I, I want to be a better, I want to be better with my finances. I want to be, I want to be better in, in my life. I want people to like me. I want friends. And so we, we think, okay, well, well, I just need to do. And we think that's what the invitation is. And so we, we bow our head and we close our eyes and, and the invitation is given and says, okay, now nobody's looking, nobody's looking, but you know that everybody's looking. Now, if you would like to have your life changed by Jesus. And internally what you're thinking is, is like, I, I want to better this. Now, if you want your life changed by Jesus, would you just slip up your hand? Now, I don't, come on, praise God, Ben. Uh, we got one. And sometimes preachers will say that. I see one, do I have another? I see two, do I have another? Praise God. And that's the typical American invitation. And, and sometimes I think that like the mindset of what we think is actually happening is something different than actually what the scriptures are telling us of what he wants to happen. Because maybe in our mind, we're thinking, if I, if I slip my hand up, and I don't want anybody looking at me because I'm kind of embarrassed. If I slip my hand up, then something just, something tingly is going to happen in my hand maybe. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe God is going to come in and I'm going to leave this place and my marriage is going to get better. I'm going to leave this place and I'm going to be a better college student. I'm going to leave this place and there's going to be more money in my bank account. If I just raise my hand and close my eyes and bow my head, I want to do that. I want more money. It's my money, and I want it now. <laughs> and so we raise our hand, and we cry, and we leave a service like this, and we walk out of here, and then we look at our bank accounts, and we're like, I still got debt. And we get back into a conversation with our spouse, and we're like, we still got problems. And we come home to our kids, and they're still off the chain. Jesus, and many of you, and I don't know if you saw this interview with Kanye, but, but, but Kanye had an experience where seed was sown into his life and then, and then the cares of this world came and crushed it and took it away to where now he would say that I tried Jesus and he didn't work out for me. But there are many Christians that are still attending church that live their lives in that type of way. 
I've tried Jesus. I've raised my hand. I said the magical prayer, but nothing has changed for me. Friends, are you get? oh man, I feel the Holy Spirit all up in this thing. I'm about to set some of you free because there's a revelation that Jesus wants you to see and it is not about him just doing for you or you doing for him. There's something deeper going on. There's a greater invitation than you just slipping up your hand. Now listen to me. If you love Jesus and you've been saved and that was your experience, I'm not trying to belittle that moment. But what I am telling you is that if that is the only moment of your Christian walk that you've ever experienced, you're missing out. There's something more. There's something more that Jesus has called us into. And our minds sometimes as a performance-driven community, as a performance-driven country, our mind immediately goes to this when we think that there's more. Do more. Get busy for the kingdom. Some of you are like, and so, and this is, and, and not only do we do this in our own individual lives, we do this in church life. And so we say, hey, we need you to start getting really busy in our church. And so we're going to have an event on Sundays, on Mondays, on Tuesdays, on Wednesdays, on Thursdays, on Fridays, on Saturdays. And we're going to need you to be at our church all the time. We got events going on. We're going to need you to be here. We're going to need people to serve at it. And we get so busy, even in like what can be good things, like even in Christian type things, like we can get so busy in our life that we miss the greater invitation of what Jesus is inviting us into. What prepared my heart for this was actually not in John. I've been reading through the four gospels for the last month or so in just preparation for for Good Friday and preparation for Easter, just in my own study, just reading through the life of Jesus. And so I've read all four of them and and just reading this story. And and I love what John said, but, but actually something caught me in Luke chapter six, verse 46. In Luke chapter six, verse 46, Jesus is also talking about a command and also his love. And tying those two concepts together earlier in his ministry. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he makes this statement. And it really intimidated me when I first read it. Because it says this. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And as a Christian, I read that and I was like, oh, oh, it convicted me. Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? And I know so many Christians that that they've raised their hands and they've said a prayer, but they're not doing actually what the Lord says. Read back Matthew 28. He says, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and also teach others commanding what I've commanded you, right? Do you even know what Jesus has commanded? Are you living by that standard? Like I, I wanna, like I want the Beatitudes and I want the Sermon on the Mount just to be ingrained in my heart and my mind. And so when I read that, I was thinking like, I almost, I almost got resaved, Michelle. Because I was like, I, I don't know if I'm always doing this. I might need to get saved again. And, and Satan loves to do this kind of stuff to us, right? He starts like questioning our relationship with God. And so he's like, okay, well, you're not doing enough. And so here's what can happen is that we make a decision. We say a prayer. And then when we read verses like this, we fall short and we feel shame. And here's what shame does. Shame is what separates us from God. Shame is what will make us want to stay out of church, stay out of Christian community, not study our Bible. Because when we get into our Bible, we start reading it. We're like, well, I don't even really understand it anyway, so I might as well just watch another Netflix show. And then we start praying and we're just like, I feel like I'm just talking to a wall, like nothing's really happening. And so we start living our lives in such a way as like, if this is the standard, you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say, I don't know if I can really do it. Luke chapter 6 also parallels, just like John does with Matthew. Luke chapter 6 also parallels with Matthew. I want to read you one more verse of scripture before we close. Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 says this, another very intimidating verse. But I want to encourage you with the hope of the end of it. We can't stop reading halfway through it. Look at what it says. Verse 15, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravishness wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Now, we just got done teaching a series through the book of Galatians talking about fruits, right? We can judge one another by the, based off of the fruit. You cannot try harder to have the fruit of the Spirit but you can yield to the work of God in your life for God to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And so he says, you can tell who's striving. You can tell who's faking it. You can tell who's faking it. 
You could sit in a small group with somebody. You could spit, sit in a church service with somebody. And like even the question that we asked before the service, some of you, you saw that question because I know it was a little bit weird for y'all. Y'all were like, uh, we're not supposed to be doing the talking today. That's you, preacher. You talk, <laughs> right? But we want a type of church where the body is sharing and fellowshipping. Like this is supposed to be a fellowship of the believers that we gather together and we celebrate the good news of the resurrection in each of our own lives. And so if I were to ask you, if I were to line you up about one by one, and I may do that before you leave, <laughs> one by one before you leave, instead of you just shaking the preacher's hand, I may just ask you, what, is the res what does the resurrection mean to you? And for some of you, if you were to be honest, and that's okay, like if that's just where you're at right now, you might would say it means nothing. I don't know. I don't know what it means. For some of you that maybe have worn the Christian title for a long time, I would may ask you and you would feel really uncomfortable about asking that question because you're not a public speaker. And you're like, I don't know if I want to talk about that. That's between me and Jesus. And so what I'm about to read to you may intimidate you, but, but stay with me, okay? Look at Matthew chapter 7. He says, we're, we're going to be able to tell one another by our fruits. He says, our grapes gathered from thorn bushes, our figs from thistles. Verse 17, so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased trees bears bad fruit. He says, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, thus you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, do, did we not prophesy in your name? Or excuse me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Now, again, we read that. What do we see? A command. If you're going to follow Jesus, don't miss this. If you're going to follow Jesus, it means doing what Jesus did. We've been talking about that in our church. Pastor Harrison's been leading that. We want to be with Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. We want to do what Jesus did, right? If you're going to follow Jesus, it is to get you to a place to where you, not just preachers, not just ordained ministers, but the body, Christians in this community and other communities, where we are living our lives in such a way that we do what Jesus did. But it's a scary thing to read. But Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. But we sung a song. We even, we even jumped up and down. Praise God. Like We gave some money to the church. He says, not everyone who's just doing will enter in the kingdom of heaven. So then what matters? Same thing we just learned a minute ago. Don't miss this point. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Verse 22. On that day, that day of judgment, that day we stand before him one day. On that day, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We are called to do the work of of the Lord. We are commissioned. We are commanded to do the work of the Lord, but it is only from a place of intimacy with him first, not the other way around. We're not striving to get his approval. Being in Christ, when I put my faith in what Jesus has done, I'm approved by him. And from that approval changes my status, changes my mindset, changes my posture and empowers me through the Holy Spirit to live a life that's holy, to live a life of prayer, to live a life in evangelism. That's where it's coming from. Not because I feel like I'm a good person and I tried really hard. Not because I was like, well, you know, I got a good personality and I'm a good public speaker. And so maybe people will listen to me and I can be an evangelist. That's not where it's coming from. Like God is no respect to a person. Did you, did you know that? Like what that means is, is like you see my life and you're like, oh man, I'll never be that. I pray to Jesus. I pray to Jesus that you would see the value of who you are in Christ. That it is not about an ordination certificate. It, it is not about, you know, you being called a pastor, your title, none of that. You are called to be on mission for God. You are called to be a missionary, right? And in that mindset, one of the things that we've got to understand as missionaries of God, as missionaries of God, we are called then to go do, 
to go do what he did. But where does that come from? Where is that overflowing from? It's overflowing from relationship with him first. And so Jesus says, you can do a lot of things in my name, but it doesn't mean that, that we know one another. Ben Tice can tell me a lot about the University of Georgia football. I don't want to hear about it, but he could tell me about it. And in telling me about it, he could tell me, who, who's the coach? Trash. Who's the fir who's first string quarterback? <laughs> I know we're not moving past that. All right. So cool. And you would say you're, you're a Georgia fan, right? You're even an alumni of Georgia. All right. And so, you know, you know about the University of Georgia football team, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when's the last time you and Kirby hung out? Never. Right. So, so, so that shows me that, that you can be a fan and know of something, but not be in relationship with something. Does that make sense? And this is how many people in the church are responding to Jesus right now, is that they know of some stuff in the Bible, and they know some good Christian people that are trying to do some good Christian things. And you may even be trying to do some good Christian things. But the Bible clearly tells us that you can be doing good Christian things in the name of Jesus and still not be with Jesus in heaven. That's a, that's a huge revelation that we got to get. And so you're like, well, then what do I got to do? I need to get my life together. I need to get, like, you may start panicking. Calm down. Calm down, because here's the invitation. The invitation is that Jesus desires communion, relationship, fellowship with you. He, he wants to be with you. <laughs> so before you can get to this place of doing, you have to recognize just being. You have to be in this place of just being with him. Don't get busy with Christianity and miss Jesus. Somebody put that on a t-shirt. Don't get busy with going through the motions of being here on Easter service and check off something off your list and say, well, I, I think I'm good. No, nah, bro. Like Jesus is inviting you into more than just a church service. We have made in America... I'm gonna get off my pedestal in just a second, okay? I promise you. But, but like, I, I just hate it because we've twisted it. We have made evangelism in America inviting somebody to a church service. That's not it, friends. There's more than that. And I'm not telling you that to be haughty. I'm telling you that with a passion to say, there is more than just being invited to a church service. You are invited to sit at the feet of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to be called friend by him and to be loved by him and to be adopted into his family and to be in relationship him with all the days of your life. Yeah. That's what Jesus is inviting us into from that place of being. Knowing Jesus is then where I can go and be empowered by him. Only from that place. And so this morning, my prayer is, is that there would be an overflow in your heart, an overflow in your life to stop striving. To stop just trying to be a good person. To stop just trying to find your identity and your title and your ethnicity, and your gender, and, and anything else, because it's not that you can't, it's not that, it's not that you can't be your own unique person, but it's that, here, here's the cool thing about Jesus, Jesus is not just hanging out with middle-aged old white guys, <laughs> like that's not, like he, he all the middle-aged old white guys in the room are like, no, he loves y'all too, like, no, he loves y'all, like Jesus's desire is not just to hang out with rich people, Jesus' desire is not just to hang out with poor people, with white people, with black people, with Hispanic people. Like, like the cool thing about Jesus, and this is his omnipresence, is like he, is the, he, like he has the capacity. I know many of us, we can only han handle about five people in our lives at a time. Maybe a little bit more if you're an extrovert. But if you're an introvert, you can't handle nobody. Jesus can handle everybody. This is what I love about him. It's like he can be personal and listen and be with me and I can sit with him and you can be with him too. You have access to him. The Bible says because of what Jesus has done, because of his death and his resurrection, he is inviting you into access and to have relationship with him. That's what's so awesome. That's what's so beautiful. And so I just want to invite you into that knowing first. Knowing him, being with him, 
before you do anything for him. Today, we're actually, and, and I want to invite those that are getting baptized this morning, you can go ahead and go get changed, but we're going to actually have some people get baptized today, and uh, praise God. Okay. It's freezing cold. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> it's not. It should, though. We should carry our cross for Jesus. Anyways, we got it. We're soft here in America. Anyways, uh, no, it's, it's nice and, and a perfect 80 degrees. Um, but, but as those people are getting ready to, to be baptized this morning, um, I want to tell you what you're about to see happening because these people are, they're, they're about to do something, but it's from a place of being first. See, they're not about to get wet because that's going to cleanse them or make them any more righteous. They're actually doing something that Jesus commands to do. I mean, we saw it in Matthew 28 that it says that Jesus says to baptize, water baptize, right? So that's a command. Sometimes I, I like to tell people that are getting water baptized, I'm like, it's always interesting that Jesus asks us to do something kind of strange to the world first publicly to see if like we really meant what we said we, we was going to do, right? Like so, sometimes Jesus invites us in to do strange things and you're like, hey, yeah, Christianity can be kind of strange. Listen, you, you can be kind of strange. Some of y'all, y'all put trees in your house during December. Uh, and I do too. And we're like, you know, and that's, we just do things. Some, some of you today, you're going to like go find eggs throughout your yard, right? And you're going to hide money if, if you got it like that. If you don't, then there's just probably some old jelly beans in there, but that's cool too. And you're going to let your kids just run around your backyard and you're like, and if we think about it, that's actually kind of weird. <laughs> but what this is, is actually not weird. It feels like it's weird. And it does for some, especially that would consider themselves introverts, take a lot of guts to get up here in front of an entire crowd of people on an Easter Sunday morning and get wet. But what are they doing? Because anything that Jesus tells us to do, there's always a deeper spiritual meaning to it. We read during Good Friday that Jesus, his, we, when we take communion, we eat his flesh, drink his blood. And that's not that we're cannibalists. It's that he just got done feeding a bunch of people bread and loaves, our, our loaves and fish. And, and they love getting fed physically. But Jesus was saying, hey, I want to I feed you spiritually. I want to I transform. I want to do something in your life that just the world can't do. And so when they're getting baptized, when they're getting immersed underwater, it's, it's showing you not only their obedience to Christ to want to follow Jesus, but it's showing you a picture of going into death with Jesus underwater and then rising from the grave, showing his resurrection power. So when they come up, we'll shout, we'll clap, we'll rejoice, but we're not rejoicing because they got saved here in this moment. We're rejoicing in the fact that Jesus did overcome and he's conquered the grave and he's got another one. We used to sing this other song, uh, hell lost another one, I am free. And we can celebrate the fact that, that another one is set free. Another one is choosing to follow Jesus. Another one is choosing to be in relationship with Jesus. And from that Wyatt relationship with Jesus, right? Here's what's going to happen. I love it. From that relationship with Jesus, it's going to empower them to do what Jesus did. And that's my prayer for you today. So would you stand to your feet today? Van, would you come up as we close? We're going to sing a song, and while those are preparing to get baptized today, if you want to get baptized, we actually have some stuff in the bathroom. We got some extra clothes, blow dryer, underwear. <laughs> I'm serious. You, I'm not even joking. I'm actually being serious. Because, I mean, my thing is like, you know, why wait? If you know that you know you want to follow Jesus, today would be a great day to do that. And so if you would like to talk with a pastor about that, uh, Pastor Harrison uh, will stand over here up front. Pastor, uh, I mean, Pastor Patrick, Pastor Harrison, if you don't mind standing over here, being somewhere close um, to pray with people. But here's what I want everybody to do. Would you, would you bow your head, close your eyes? No, I'm just kidding. Don't bow. I told, I told y'all that's not what it's about. <laughs> It's not what it's about. So I'm actually not going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm actually going to ask you to like think on Jesus in this moment and make a decision because you have been given the gospel of what Jesus has done for you. You know that Jesus has risen from the grave and he desires relationship with you this morning. The question that you're being faced with today is do you desire relationship with him? And I don't know about you, but when I chose to get on, y'all can't see this, I'm gonna get on one knee. When I chose to get on one knee and say, Katie Atkins, will you marry me? And y'all, she said, yes. 
And so we've been going 22 years together. And so I got to, like, I didn't bring her around my family and say, like, ah, uh, you know, I'm going to marry her. No, no, no. Like, I'm proud of her. Like, I'm grateful for this relationship that I have. And so I want to tell everybody about it. Even more so, thank you, baby. Even more so, like, that's just an earthly, like, and I love her. But with Jesus, if I'm making a decision to follow him, listen, Romans 1 says, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's power of God unto salvation unto everyone who believes. Let's get rid of the culture that is constantly like belittling the fact of what Jesus wants to do in our life and saying, well, we don't, we don't want you to feel embarrassed. We don't, we don't want you to feel uncomfortable. Not nah, like, I want to be called out from, from death to life. I'm going to be uncomfortable through that. I want Jesus to transform my life. I want to be with him. I don't want to be ashamed of him. If you're still in a place of like shame or doubt or questions, like that's cool. You, there's a place for, you can ask those questions. You can process that. I want you to be able to ask hard questions. But if you feel like the Holy Spirit's drawing you right now in this moment, you're like, what does that feel like? I don't know, like a, like a pulling, <laughs> like a yearning to say, yes, come, come to me abide in me and I will abide in you. Come be with me. I want to be with you. The Bible says in James, whoever, whoever seeks the Lord, you will find him. And so just in faith, if you desire to seek him, you call upon his name, you believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. You say, I believe that you rose from the grave and I desire for you to be my king. I desire for you to be my Lord. I want to follow you, Jesus. But ultimately, I want to be with you, Jesus. He loves you so much. He does. And I really can't teach it outside of just telling you, even from my own experience, I have felt the love of God just change my life. Not, not rules, not commandments. He's called me into, into commandments and he's called me to live a holy life, but, but I, I don't want to live holy from a place of obligation. I, I want to live holy because I want, I want him to be pleased. I, 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 want, I want to honor my God that I love so much. And so, I don't know, I'll shut up now. I'm just so excited. But if that's you this morning, if you'd like to follow Jesus today, I don't want to ask you to close your eyes or bow your head or raise your hand. But if you want to follow Jesus, it's just as simple as that. There's no, it's not a magical prayer. It's really just faith in saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want you to be my Lord. I believe that you've risen from the grave. I mean, there's all kinds of prayers that you could pray, but that's, that's the gist of it is you want to follow Jesus. You're calling on him to be Lord. I want to be in relationship with you. If that's you, don't look to me and say it. Don't look to your neighbor and say it. Look to Jesus and say it. And say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose again. So if that's you today, would you, like, I guess one thing that would be helpful is you let other people know. Would you let one of our pastors know? Would you come let me know? We want to rejoice in that. We want to celebrate if that's you. It's not just going to all like change today. <laughs> it's going to be a lifetime process and we want to walk with you or help you be in community to walk with other people, to grow in your faith. But let me pray for you. We're going to sing. We're just going to give you a moment to reflect on the message and then we're going to baptize some folks and celebrate what Jesus is doing in this place, okay? Lord Jesus, we love you today. We honor you. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you for your word that's true, God. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus, you desire a relationship with us, Jesus. Holy Spirit, work in this place. If there's a need in this place, Lord, we pray that you would meet it. Lord, if there's a burden in this place, Lord, we pray that, that yokes would be removed, Lord, to take on your yoke that's easy. Jesus, meet with your people today, Lord. We have come hungry to meet with the living God. Every other God is an idol who cannot see, who cannot feel. There is one true living God and you are that God. We come to worship you and to be with you today. Before we get sent out to go do anything, Lord, may we just be invited to be with you today, Jesus. Minister your people in this moment. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing.